Good afternoon. My name is Philippe Cunningham and I'm the chair of the committee. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health and Environment Public Health and Safety Committee for January 21st, 2021. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the city council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.201 due to the declared local public health emergency. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this Meeting. Council Member Gordon? Here. Cano? Aye. Ellison? Palmasano? Present. Fletcher? Here. Council Member Ellison? And Chair Cunningham? Present. There are five ayes. Five present. Thank you. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. Colleagues on our agenda today, we have 10 items. We have one public hearing, five consent items, and four discussion items. We'll go ahead and get started with our public hearing today. We are looking, uh, we have uh, commit the Commission on Civil Rights Appointments. We're looking at mayoral appointments as well as uh, a city council appointment. Um, so we will have a staff presentation um, and we, I believe we have some appointees who um, will be on the line to be able to speak to this. So um, I will open, uh, hand the floor over to Kayla. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Cunningham, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kayla McConandiera, and I'm here from the Civil Rights Department. Um, I'm very happy to be here to put forward our proposed list of civil rights commissioners today. Um, it's a very talented group of individuals with varied backgrounds and experiences and skills um, that we believe will greatly contribute to the work of the commission. Um, chapter 141 of the Minneapolis Code uh, sets forth the required parameters for the civil rights commission and requires it to have 21 seated members, six to eight of which should be attorneys. Uh, with this slate of proposed commissioners, if approved, we will have a fully seated commission ready to do this important and greatly needed civil rights work in the city of Minneapolis. Uh, we are requesting that four commissioners be reappointed and that nine new commissioners be appointed. And I'm gonna go through each proposed commissioner and share just a bit about their background. Um, as Chair Cunningham noted, we do have some of the proposed commissioners present um, on the call today um, and some have have indicated a desire to make a short statement regarding their candidacy or appointment. Um, so what I'll do is after I, I provide my brief summary of that individual commissioner, I will turn to that commissioner to make a statement for those who wished to do so. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone, all the proposed commissioners for taking time to be with us today and participate in the meeting. Um, I will begin with the proposed reappointments. So first we have Jared Widseth, who is proposed to fill seat one, and he is from Ward 8. Mr. Widseth is an employment litigation attorney with volunteer lawyering experience in housing and immigration law, who has served successfully on the commission starting last year in 2020. Uh, Mr. Widseth did indicate that he'd like to make a statement, so I will turn it over to him now. Welcome, Mr. Witzeth. Uh, you will need to push star six to be able to uh, unmute yourself. Welcome. Hello, uh, council members, can you hear me? We sure can, thanks. All right, hi, um, thank you for having me at this meeting today and I am uh, honored to have this nomination and, and seek this appointment again. Uh, this is, uh, work that I'm passionate about. It's well within my wheelhouse and what I do at my day job. And I really appreciate the opportunity to give back to the city in this uh, service. And um, clearly now more than ever coming off of 2020 and going into 2021 with all of the challenges that remain from 2020, it's uh, critical work for the city to do. And I would uh, love to keep on doing it if you guys approve my, uh, my nomination. And uh, I, I will answer questions if you have any, but I just want to say it's an, it's an honor and I look forward to putting my nose back on the grindstone and getting back to work. Great, thank you so much. 
Thank you very much. Um, okay, so next we have Jeffrey Cobia uh, proposed to fill seat four, and he's from Ward 10. Mr. Cobia is a patent attorney with extensive volunteer experience in legal and non-legal community work. Um, and he has also served successfully on the commission since uh, the beginning of last year in 2020. He has a special interest in increasing community outreach work that the commission does. Next is Catherine Stevens, proposed to fill seat five. She's from Ward 12. Ms. Stevens is a Hennepin County supervisor with mediation experience who has successfully served on the commission as secretary starting in 2020 and has taken on and led numerous commission tasks and initiatives. Next is Paul Herkman, proposed to fill seat seven from Ward 5. Mr. Herkman is an NGO executive director working on issues of human trafficking, the refugee crisis, and gender and class-based violence. Uh, he has served successfully on the commission for multiple years now. Uh, moving now to proposed new appointments for commissioners. Uh, we have Andrew Crowder, who is proposed to fill seat two. Uh, he's from Ward 13. He's a licensed attorney with pro bono civil rights practice and an interest in educating the community about their rights and serving in a liaison role between the community and the city. Uh, Mr. Crowder had indicated that he'd like to make a statement, so I will let him do that now. Welcome, Mr. Crowder. Please push star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, so great. I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, as everybody knows, this last year was insane, as uh, Mr. Woods has said. Um, I, I initially was very involved in my community in Chicago when I lived there. I was a public school teacher through Teach for America for a couple years. and to be frank, I'm tired of sitting on the sidelines and my pro bono work as an attorney is, is satisfying and fulfilling, but it's not enough and I'm not working as hard as I could be for the people in my community. So that's, that's why I'm likewise honored and uh, to be nominated. And I, I hope that you find that I'm uh, someone who could push things forward and, and keep your work going. So glad to be here. Happy to answer any questions you have and excited to get started. If you guys agree that I'm uh, to be a good member. Thank you so much, Mr. Crowder. I also was a public school teacher in Chicago. So welcome, glad to have you here and thank you for your interest in being of service. Fantastic. Um, okay, next we have Mackenzie Colas proposed to fill seat three. She's from Ward 7. Um, Ms. Colas is a Hennepin County social worker and has been highly involved in the racial equity work with the county and is interested in seeing more social workers engaged in this type of work in the community. Next is Kenneth Rance, proposed to fill seat six, and he's from Ward 5. He serves as the Director of Development for the Northside Economic Opportunity Network, and he previously served on the Minneapolis Police Conduct Review Panel. He's interested specifically in issues surrounding um, police reform, public safety, and voting rights. Next is Bob Fine, proposed to fill seat 10 from Ward 13. Mr. Fine is a licensed attorney and actually previously served on the commission from 1980 to 1998. Uh, he also served on the Minneapolis Park Board for many years, and he's looking forward to bringing representation both from his ward, but also from the Jewish community and the senior community to the commission. Uh, Mr. Fine did indicate that he'd like to make a statement, so he can do so now. Good afternoon, Mr. Fine. Thank you for being here. Please push star six uh, to be unmuted. Welcome. Okay, I th thank you, Chair Cunningham. Can you hear me? We sure can, thanks. Okay, great. So Chair Cunningham and council members, just a brief statement. Uh, I was on the commission for about 18 years. I enjoyed and I wrote a lot of the rules, both for contested cases and the rules and how they conduct it was a long time ago, and I've been more renewed into civil rights, especially after taking a civil rights tour uh, about a little over a year ago in, in Georgia and Alabama, which was really interesting and sort of sparked my interest about getting involved again in civil rights, in which I not only studied it, but was on the commission for a very long time. So I look forward and, and would ask your uh, confirmation of the appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fine. And thank you for your previous service, and we're we're grateful to have.
have you back. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we have Blythe Davis uh, proposed to fill seat 11, also from Ward 11. Uh, Ms. Davis is a real estate agent and participated in Black Votes Matter Minnesota and supports Minneapolis Parks programs. She's interested in strengthening communication between the community and law enforcement. Next is Jane Swift, uh, proposed to fill seat 13 from Ward 10. Ms. Swift is an educator, researcher, and organizer of the Minneapolis chapter of the Sex Worker Outreach Project and did a considerable amount of work to help pass the city's new adult entertainment ordinance. Uh, she's particularly interested in promoting the rights of residents and workers. Next is Mark Stagnani, proposed to fill seat 19. He's from Ward 11. Mr. Stagnani is a licensed attorney and served previously on the giving committee at Thomson Reuters. He was also an early participant in Books for Africa. He's interested in serving in his attorney capacity to support the commission's efforts to promote and protect civil rights. Mr. Stagnani had indicated he'd like to make a statement, so I will let him do that now. Welcome, Thank Mr. You. Stagnati. If you, oh, sounds like you're already uh, un, unmuted. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, committee, for uh, considering my candidacy. I am a long-term 36, 30 some year resident of Minneapolis. Uh, I am motivated as well to move off the sidelines and become you know, intimately involved with the actions and, and uh, governance of the city in this role. Uh, one of my special sets of skills is that I am an analytics uh, expert and hold myself out as one. I'm able to uh, deal with large reams of data and bring them in uh, a non-biased uh, light forward to help make uh, items you know, pop out factually. Thank you for your time and I re received my time back. Thank you. Grateful to have you here. Next, we have Victoria Folk uh, proposed to fill seat 20 from Ward 11. Ms. Folk is a marketing professional at Alina Health and a member of the Tangletown Neighborhood Association, and she's on its racial equity task force. She is interested in providing her perspective to the commission as a woman of color and young professional, and is particularly interested in promoting public awareness and engagement with the commission. Uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, we have Ashley Gold proposed to fill seat nine. She's from Ward 12. She is a youth advocate and musician working with the Mobile Jazz Project, and she regularly volunteers at the George Floyd Memorial. Uh, Ms. Gold is interested in helping to eliminate discrimination and bias in the city, as well as identify community concerns and educate the public. Um, so with that, that's our list. Um, I'm happy to ans answer any additional questions as are I know all of the prospective commissioners that are on the line with us today. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. One of the things that I really um, like for us to do in, in this particular committee is to take the time uh, to actually give a little background about all the folks who are taking their time outside of work, uh, whether it's volunteer or on very small stipends to be able to um, bring service, to be of service to our city. So thank you, Keila, for taking the time um, to do so. So now I will proceed to open the public hearing um, I will ask the clerk if there are any speaker, any other speakers in queue on this item. Uh, there are no registered speakers for item one. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there anyone on the line who is here to speak to this item? All right, hearing no speakers and uh, having no one have signed up, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and I will make a motion uh, to approve this uh, slate of appointments and we'll ask the clerk to call the roll on item number one. Council member Gordon. Aye. Kano. Um, I'd like to say present to make up for the previous aye, but I will just say aye. Alyssa. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Chair Cunningham? Aye. There are six ayes. 
that that carries and that motion is approved. Thank you to all of the appoint, appointees who are here today um, to speak and for all of the appointees for dedicating your time to serve our city this way. Now, moving forward, our consent agenda for today is as follows. Item number two is authorizing uh, authorizing signature by the Minneapolis Health Commissioner or their designee on updated and expanded health care plan insurance contracts for school-based clinic, service per, uh, clinic services reimbursement. Item number three is authorizing the Minneapolis Police Department to enter into a re uh, release of liability hold harmless and defense and indemnification agreement with the Metropolitan Council related to ownership and maintenance of the workforce director system. Item number four is authorizing issuance of a request for proposals for violence interruption outreach services for the Office of Violence Prevention's Minneapolis Strategic Outreach Initiative. Item number five is referring to the Policy and Government Oversight Committee for setting the here this for the setting of a public hearing and an ordinance amending Title II, Chapter 41 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to administration, information governance, adding a new article entitled Facial Recognition Technology. And item number six is a staff direction related to the, the creation of eliminating uh, an eliminating child led poisoning action plan. Uh, that staff direction is written in full on the um, on the agenda. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda or are there any items that anyone would like to pull off for further discussion? All right, seeing none, I will just say for item number six, um, related to the um, eliminating child lead poisoning action plan that that is inspired and based uh, inspired by and, and based on the hard work of the public health advisory committee. Um, they did extensive work being able to lay out the case and particular strategies as to how we can completely eliminate new cases of lead poisoning um, in children in the city of Minneapolis. And so, um, so thank you to each one of the Public Health Advisory Committee members for their dedication and work, and we look forward to taking that and putting it into action. With that, um, and seeing no um, council members in queue, I'll move approval of the consent agenda and we'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Gordon? Aye. Hanno? Aye. Allison? Aye. Palmasano? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Chair Cunningham? Aye. There's six ayes. That carries and the consent agenda is approved. With that, we'll move to our discussion items. Colleagues, we have four very critical discussion items for today um, that I'm excited for us to dig into. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with our first discussion item, which is receiving and filing a report related to the Minneapolis Workplace Advisory Committee's worker outreach and engagement recommendations for safely reopening the downtown economy. Uh, we have a presentation today uh, from our, we have city staff, Brian Walsh, as well as uh, representatives from the Workplace Advisory Committee, uh, Veronica, Veronica Mendez Moore and Wade Lundberg. So I will go ahead and, and turn it over for the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Great. Hi, I'm Veronica Mendez Moore, and I will jump right in. Um, thank you, uh, Councilmember Cunningham and the committee for hearing us out today. Um, so we're here because we know that our entire community and economy is suffering from the, all of the hits as a result of COVID. We all want to get back to a place where our economy can thrive, um, where workers can go back to work uh, and also go back safely so that their families can be safe and our communities can all be safe from the pandemic. And as we've seen some of the industries uh, rebuild, we're seeing that disproportionately some of the workers who are suffer suffering the consequences of COVID and the pandemic are uh, black, indigenous, and people of color who are taking huge risks to put food on the table and to keep our economy moving forward. And recently, the Workplace Advisory Committee member organizations have been hearing directly from a number of workers about their experiences um, that we want to talk a bit about today. But, but what's clear in this is that um, we know 
uh, businesses have, have had a number of different sort of forums and venues in which they could talk about how to reopen and what their concerns and suggestions are. And we just think it's critically important for there be, to be a space uh, for workers who are on the front line every day who are really the experts and what they need in order to be safe uh, to be heard and to, to be able to provide some recommendations to the city as to how we move forward. Because I think we I think we all know that worker safety in this context really equals public health. Um, and if workers aren't safe, it is it, it has a greater impact on our entire um, communities and in public health in general. Um, so our, our framework here is to begin focusing specifically on the downtown Minneapolis area to create this worker subcommittee of the Minneapolis Workplace Advisory Committee to make recommendations um, about reopening in downtown where workers can really communicate directly to the city and the policymakers. So that's sort of my overview on this, but most importantly, I really want to turn it over to a few um, a few workers of, of uh, that are members of different organizations on the on the WAC uh, to talk a little bit about why uh, this is an issue um, and uh, from their own experiences. Um, so I'll start turning it over to uh, Dan Scoggins from SAU Local 26. Welcome, Dan. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman and council members, I've been a security officer or manager of security for 30 years, all of this in downtown Minneapolis or St. Paul. Currently, I'm a union steward for SEIU Local 26. It's in that capacity I came to speak to you today. Security officers and janitors are essential workers. We have been working all through the pandemic. We have about 6,000 janitors and 2,000 security officers in the Twin Cities, representing every race, religion, and background of our city. Since we are working, many of our members or family members have been ill from COVID. When COVID strikes our families, we have the double burden of managing the illness and our family members being put out of work on quarantine. I'm an example. Twice this year, I've been out of work due to sick family members. I missed 10 days in July when my wife was sick and 10 days in December when my daughter was sick. It's used all the vacation and sick time I had when my wife was also out in July as well. SEIU Local 26 has been granting $300 to each member from our strike fund to help members who, who are out due to COVID illness. We've given 742 members $300 grants. That's $222,000 of our strike fund. We've also sadly seen four of our members die from COVID. We also know that because of longstanding disparities in our city and state, this virus has hit and hurt the communities of color especially hard. The six days provided by the emergency safety and sick time ordinances are not enough. We need to add more time for COVID related illnesses. Now I'm a 10 year employee. I have had some vacation time in Minneapolis safe and sick time, but if it came between paying your rent or feeding your family, will essential workers always tell the truth and be quarantined? These are ethical questions that rich people argue about. My working class brothers and sisters don't have the luxury of ethics. We live paycheck to paycheck. If we want people to keep each other safe, we need to be paid when we're quarantined by our employers. I attended the most recent workers council meeting, which had representatives of various working groups and unions. We discussed the following, following COVID safety issues. An emergency extension of the safe and sick time for two more weeks for COVID, right to recall to your old job after layoff, right to stay home if you're not safe at work, right to refuse unsafe work, strong enforcement of the current safety expectations, and maybe reimbursement from employers for the cost of the mandatory PPE we're all paying for. This council is also proposing their own downtown workers council as I understand it. So in order for Minneapolis to reopen safely, we need the voices of workers telling their stories. We need the input of those still working downtown. I'm glad the city council is starting the process to engage with those downtown workers to hear from our experience, not just our bosses and huge corporations, so the city can safely reopen. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Um, and, and I'm next gonna, we have two other folks uh, that are uh, downtown workers to speak briefly. I'm gonna turn it over now to Gloria, who's a member of CITL and Taylor, uh, who's an organizer who will be interpreting from Spanish to English. Welcome, Gloria and Taylor. Do we have them on the line? 
Uh, I believe I see them on here. Just make sure you're unmuted. Gloria, puedes quitar el mudo? Taylor, you are muted still, just so you know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're just waiting for Gloria to unmute. Star six. Is she on the phone? She is on the phone. She was yes. unable to get, yes. Okay, yep, so she would need to push star six uh, to unmute. Okay, Gloria, go ahead. Okay, maybe maybe we'll um we'll move forward to uh try, try to get that taken care of, Taylor. If you can uh help figure out offline, and meanwhile we can hear from uh hear from Jamel, who is um a worker at the Marquette Hotel. Oh, welcome. Uh, good day. Um, my name is Jamel Thomas. Working at the market the hotel is my livelihood, my survival plan. Uh, rain, sleet, snow, nothing can stop me from going to this job every day, on point, every morning, never late, always early. I miss the place. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes driving home from going, taking care of errands and running, doing things for my family, I go out of my way just to drive past the hotel to see how things is looking over there. The curtains are closed and I just shake my head thinking, man, that's 17 years of my life. And I would like to continue my life at the Marquette Hotel because that helped me uh, keep stable and pay the bills and take care of my grandkids and all of that good stuff. It's none of our faults that the uh, COVID-19 had happened and it would feel like a knife in my back if the company gave my job to someone else. We're just asking to make sure that for the politicians, if they can help make sure that we get our jobs back and eventually. And we come back first before any new employees because a lot of us been there for over, I've been there for 17 years myself and a lot of other people have been there like 30 years, 31, 35 years. And you know, it was all good people. We all loved each other. It's like family it was more than just friends, you know? So I would love to go back to the hotel if, you know, it's possible instead of somebody else taking my job and rear, rear ending me for less pay, you know? Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Jamal. And this is the reason we need our workers' council in Minneapolis. We need that um, desperately. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you for being here and telling telling your story. It's much appreciated. And thank you for the work that you've that you've done here in our city. Thank you. No and it sounds like we might have Gloria. I think uh, Taylor. Do we have Gloria? Mm -hmm. Okay, I just saw she was unmuted, but now it looks like she's muted again. Gloria, puedes quitarlo otra vez? She would need to push star six. Um, if she, and also make sure that she's unmuted on her phone as well. Hola. Si. Sí. Hola, Taylor. Sí, aquí estamos. Puedes seguir hablando. Ahora escuchamos a usted. Oh, lo siento. No podía entrar. Uh, hola, este, hola a todos. Buen día y gracias por el tiempo que me permiten para, para hablar, dar uh, un poco sobre mi experiencia, mi testimonio. Uh, ¿sí Taylor, ¿estás interpretando? I was going to wait until the end to make it easier to not have to stop and start, but uh, my name is Gloria. 
Uh, sorry, I've had some difficulties. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience and my story. Uh, yo trabajaba en el downtown, en un restaurante para el downtown. Uh, y bueno, todo por el COVID, pues eh, perdí mi trabajo por lo de la pandemia. So I work in downtown, I work in a restaurant downtown, and because of COVID and because of the pandemic, I've lost my job. Uh, ahora este, pues el restaurante ya, ya está definitivamente cerrado, Son, eran dos restaurantes del dueño y definitivamente cerraron. Y bueno, uh, lo que yo estaba, he estado esperando de, de ellos, de, de mi, de mi, del, del dueño, eh, que me de mi, mi hoja para hacer mis taxas del año pasado porque no he podido hacer mis taxas y se las he pedido pero no me la han dado e igual manera me que no me pagaron 35 horas de enfermedad y bueno So the restaurant where I was working has actually uh, definitively closed down. Uh, the owner had two restaurants and they won't actually open back up again because of the pandemic. Uh, however, what I'd been waiting for from them, um, from the boss, was my W-2 for my taxes from last year and from this year. Um, I haven't been able to do my taxes even from last year. I've asked them um, and they still have not provided that to me. And also I have 35 hours of earned sick and safe time that I have been unable to be paid for. Y bueno, pues la verdad que pues ha sido muy difícil todo este tiempo porque no he podido encontrar un trabajo estable. Todos los trabajos, bueno, he trabajado, pero no son estables esos trabajos y pues me ha perjudicado mucho todo esto. Yo creo que a todos en general nos ha perjudicado lo del COVID. Y bueno, yo estoy esperando que el downtown abra nuevamente ya pues bien pero de una manera más segura, protegiéndonos a todos, como trabajadores y clientes y todos. You know, the truth is this has been a very difficult time. I haven't been able to find a stable job. I've worked several different jobs, but nothing with, with stability. Um, I've lost a lot from this experience. I think all of us have been uh, very impacted by COVID. I do hope that downtown opens back up uh, and I hope that it opens up in a more safe, more secure way that protects all of us as workers, as clients, as customers, all of us. Um, bueno, bueno, solo eso es lo que quería comentar. Muchas gracias por, por el tiempo y que tengan un excelente, un excelente tarde. So, you know, thank you so much. Wanted to share about my experience and and um, what we need. And so thank you so much for having me here today. I think that's all that I uh, can share at this time. Gracias, thank you so much. Thank you. So just to, just to summarize uh, very quickly, you know, the examples that we've heard today are really just, they're very representative of the concerns that we've heard across the board that are about safety in this moment, new potential legislation, new potential uh, um, just focuses by the city, whether it's administrative or, um, or regulatory, but then also just ensuring that uh, that the existing laws are being, um, are being followed so that workers aren't really slipping through the cracks in this pandemic. So with that, we are, um, you know, we are calling for the subcommittee uh, comprised of downtown essential workers to inform the WAC and the city council as how we can partner together to reopen downtown safely. Thank you. Thank you so, so much uh, for, for this presentation and all of the work that you've done. It's been incredibly critical. Um, 
and and for bringing in uh, our workers' voices um, into this into this conversation. So thank you for for that. Um, I have Councilmember Fletcher in queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of the workers and advocates who uh, came and shared your perspective today. I think it's so critical that as we are uh, contemplating reopening and contemplating really restarting our economy, that we make sure that the workers uh, whose uh, health and well-being are impacted on the front lines are, are being consulted and are a part of this. Uh, I want to bring forward a staff direction uh, that really just says exactly what uh, uh, what we just heard, that we want to form uh, a uh, subcommittee, a downtown workers subcommittee of the Workplace Advisory Committee. This is work that they have uh, proposed to do and that I think it's uh, good at this time for the council to express our support for this, that we want to be informed by this work. Uh, that this is something that we see value in. So I really appreciate the people who've taken the initiative to to form this subcommittee and and to uh, initiate this work. And I hope that uh, my colleagues will will join uh, me today in expressing uh, uh, support for the work moving forward. Uh, we set uh, you know a request that you come back with recommendations no later than July. I know that everybody's anxious to do the work. Uh, even more quickly than that, as we start to face decisions about uh, reopening, uh, as we uh, uh, as things move along in the vaccination process, et cetera. So, uh, so we'll leave that there as a um, as 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 one deadline to make sure we get a report back. But I know we'll we'll hear more from you uh, even in the interim, and just really really appreciate uh, the work, both of the work that you're proposing to get back to, and the work that you're doing to make sure that that's safe for everybody. So, with that, I'll move the staff direction that you see on the screen. Councilmember Fletcher has made a motion to approve the staff direction that is being currently displayed um, on the screen. Are there any questions or comments related to this staff direction? Mr. Chair, I see the clerk requesting that I read the staff direction, so I would be yes. happy to, to do that. Great, thank you. So, yeah. uh, directing staff in the Labor Standards Division of the Civil Rights Department to work with the Workplace Advisory Committee to form a downtown workers subcommittee to identify options for safeguarding the health and safety of the downtown workforce as it returns from shutdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic and to report back to the Public Health and Safety Committee with initial recommendations no later than July 31st, 2021. Thank you for that, Council Member. I have Council Member Palmasano in queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just curious if the author could speak a little bit as to why um, why this would be exclusive to downtown. I know the people that we heard from um, are focused in organized downtown, but why um, the focus specifically to downtown workers at this time? It's just a it's just a curiosity. Thanks. Uh, sure. So I think that um, I appreciate the question. Uh, the biggest reason I think is is that the the organization of employers and the, sort of the downtown council formation is also oriented to downtown and making sure that workers have a voice in that conversation feels like um, it felt like a place to focus the work. And I think this is a place where there's real alignment and collaboration, and we just want to make sure that there's uh, uh, voices at that table. We know that in general, uh, you know, regulations about returning to work are, are going to be uh, established citywide. But I think in terms of uh, some very specific decisions about uh, um, that are specific to the downtown core around the return of tourism, around some of the regulations that really uh, are most going to affect downtown uh, timing around the convention center restarting its business um, that impact thousands of workers uh, who work in all of the supporting facilities around uh, some of that activity. I think it, it, it makes sense to have a downtown focus even as we uh, contemplate citywide recovery. Councilmember Palmasano, did you, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, it wasn't really a direct question. It was asking him to speak more about why we okay. focus on downtown. Um, you know, I, I understand there's how many hospitality workers that are predominantly downtown are out of work right now. Um, and I just wanted to better understand some of the thoughts and efforts that will go into this. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments related to the staff direction? All right, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll on Council Member Fletcher's motion. Council Member Gordon? Aye. Hanno? 
Aye. Ellison? Aye. Palmasano? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Chair Cunningham? Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and that motion is approved. Thank you again uh, to uh, Veronica and everyone who came to speak today, all of the workers. Uh, your voice is critical in this conversation. Um, we hear you and uh, thank you to Councilmember Fletcher for helping us move forward in a way to institutionalize their voice um, in, in this process, so thank you. Um, so seeing no further discussion on that, I will direct the clerk to file the Workplace Advisory Committee's report. Colleagues, we'll go ahead and move on now to item number eight, which is our community safety update. It is our monthly update um, around public safety and community safety here um, in our city. So we will be receiving and filing presentation. We have uh, Commander Case, Austin Rice, and uh, Scott Wolford to uh, give this presentation today. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham. Um, thank you. Do we have the um, PowerPoint up? There it is. Thank you. So this is kind of the second installment of my presentation to the council um, during this particular meeting. Um, we I changed up the flow of it a little bit. So um, this is kind of our opportunity to set the stage for the year. And I'm um, looking for feedback from the council members if there's other things that you want included in this briefing. So um, I'm gonna do just some introductions as far as um, who's gonna be presenting. Last time I went through most of the statistical and the analytics part of it. Um, <clears throat> This time what I'm gonna do is have Scott Wolfert and Austin Rice do that part of it. We'll, there'll be some discussion and then I'll, you know, obviously still be here and then um, answer questions and any uh, type of follow-up that needs to be done. I'm not sure where the PowerPoint went to. There it is. So if you could just uh, go ahead and flip to the next slide. So I already took care of introductions, I guess, as far as naming. Scott and Austin both work for me in the Strategic anal uh, Analysis Unit, and they are subject matter experts in the realm of data and specifically um, crime or reported crime in the city of Minneapolis. So I defer to them on most things um, data related daily. And so I, I felt it was really important that we give them their voice to, to speak to their work. Um, so that was my decision to have them present to the council, especially with some of the questions that came up last time, which were actually really good questions. And I think it's important to be able to facilitate the conversation in a more live um, um, venue, as opposed to me having to come back uh, in, in subsequent meetings to answer those questions. Um, and then, so once we start this off, I'm gonna have Scott um, talk about some of the follow-up questions that were um, posed at the, uh, the last, um, public health and safety meeting in November when we met last. And then there'll be an analysis of the crime trends and data that Austin's going to be uh, taking care of. And then as I mentioned, there'll be questions for follow-up. And last time it seemed to work pretty good where if council members had a question um, kind of during the discussion, it was just asked. So I guess I'll defer to Chair Cunningham if we wanna just keep that flow going or just kind of see how it all works itself out or hold them until the end and then I can answer questions at the end. Uh, yeah. Any questions before we get going, Chair or Council members? Let's just go ahead and, and have it um, if questions come up along the way um, so that you all don't have to try to shuffle back through the presentation or anything like that. So if it's cool with you, we'll go ahead and and uh, if as questions pop up, we'll, we'll answer them. Yep, no, that works. Um, you'll have to, um, forgive me, we'll be switching over some of this with this virtual uh, meeting forum, so hopefully I'll get things right. But if you want to go ahead and start with the next slide, and then I'm going to hand this over to Scott, and he can uh, take it from here. Yes. Uh, so um, two questions were posed last time, um, and uh, it's, since it's been a little while, I'll go through what the questions were, and then what we have on the screen are the answers. Um, and so the first question was asked how many gunshot wound victims list their address to uh, Minneapolis. And so looking back through, um, we did confirm that in 2020, 62% uh, of gunshot wound victims, uh, fatal and non-fatal, reported res uh, residing in the city of Minneapolis. Um, and then so moving on to the second question, it was in regards to ShotSpotter and the coverage areas. Um, what we did is we went back through um, 2019, 
and 2020 and compared the same uh, area since uh, in 2020, I believe it was in August, ShotSpotter um, was expanded. So what we did is essentially compare apples to apples for 2019 and 2020. Um, that uh, comparison experienced a 119% increase from 2019 into 2020 with that same area. So it did reduce um, the uh, amount of percent change by 22% when we actually compared the apples to apples. So that was a, that was a good question. Um, and then if you could go on to the next uh, slide, um, we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to transition it over to Austin here after this one, and I'm just going to talk. He's going to talk through um, the 2020 uh, Uniform Crime Reporting Part One crimes for um, last year um, in two separate uh, categories: violent crime and property crime. And then we're going to move into kind of like a crime snapshot, uh, different crime uh, phenomena for. Uh, UCR analysis for this year and then at a discussion of recent trends and emerging patterns that we're seeing. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please, or the next slide after this. Um, so looking at uh, our 2020 violent crime metrics for uh, the end of the year, uh, just to start off, these are preliminary numbers. They're uh, subject to change after we submit them to the FBI as a part of the UCR NIBRS uh, crime reporting uh, process. Um, I just wanted to highlight here real quick a couple of the metrics you'll see throughout the next few slides that we utilize. Uh, we're looking at a one year percent change uh, from 2019 to 2020, but uh, if you notice there uh, on the left side, there's a previous four year average and what that is is essentially giving you uh, an idea of kind of what we s typically see uh, during the time frame. And in this case, it's 2016 through uh, 2019 uh, for each year. Uh, and then also domestic aggravated assault uh, is a sub subcategory of aggravated assault. So just keep that in mind as we go through. But uh, just to review, homicides were up 70.8%, uh, rape down 21%, robberies, uh, which include uh, various categories, which we'll get into uh, in detail a little bit later, was up overall 46.6%, aggravated assault 23.5%, domestic aggravated assault, which again is a subset down 7.7%. One of the key takeaways here uh, is that we actually saw a, a decrease in the proportionality of domestic aggravated assaults uh, from that aggravated assault uh, general over overview or category. So basically meaning a, a lesser proportion of our aggravated assaults were domestic related in 2020. Moving on to the next slide, please. Property crime, a few key takeaways here, uh, burglary up 18.4%. Of course, this uh, saw a very sharp increase uh, during the civil unrest over the summer uh, with reported business burglaries spiking in a very short time frame. Uh, and then we continue to maintain an elevated uh, level uh, throughout the end of the year. Larceny is down 9.9%. Uh, there is uh, a caveat to that category though, we'll get into it just similar to robberies. There are subcategories within that that vary pretty greatly, um, which we'll cover uh, in a few slides, but theft for motor vehicle is one of those subcategories up 25.3%, auto theft uh, up 35.9%, and arson again impacted by the civil unrest over the summer up 69.5% uh, year over year. Uh, next slide, please. In the next slide. Looking at our uh, sort of snapshot for the first 18 days of the year, uh, we chose the 18th just as that's the most recent day in which we had the most uh, finalized reports, no uh, reports pending approval or anything like that. So uh, highest accuracy date that we could get to in as close to real time as possible. Homicide, we are up one homicide. Uh, two versus one, so it wasn't really applicable or uh, statistically fair to, to put a percent change on that. Rape is up 22.7% to start off the year. Robberies up 59.7%, continuing the elevated rates we saw towards the end of last year. 
Aggravated assault down slightly 3.6% and domestics down 31.8%. Next slide, please. Going to property crime, uh, burglary, we're seeing a 9.6% decrease versus the same time uh, last year. Larceny down 34%, uh, as we'll talk about here later, very likely due to the downturn uh, in economic activity and businesses being open, uh, limited hours, so on and so forth. Theft from motor vehicle being a subset of that greater category down 18.5%, and auto theft down very slightly 5.8%. Arson up 350%, but I did want to note um, arson can be anything from a vehicle to a building to a trash can uh, that's intentionally set on fire. So just keep that in mind um, as we go throughout uh, this year's crime metrics. Next slide, please. And I will actually turn it over to Scott again to touch on some of the violent crime specifics. All right, um, if we want to go on to the next slide, I will talk about gun crime and robbery and the next slide after that. Uh, so this slide is touching on shooting victims, both um, in this case, non-fatal and fatal are um, included in these numbers. And I'm going to start with the table on the right. Um, and you can see for 2020, we ended with 551 victims of gunshot wound. Um, that's a year uh, compared to 2019, which had 269 victims. And that previous four average that we use typically, we've referenced it before in, in the slide, uh, was is 283 victims. Um, so that one year percent change from uh, 2019 is 105%. Um, so far this year in that same window of time, the first through the 18th, uh, we're at 21 victims, and that's a 250% change um, over 2020, which had six. And uh, going back using that four-year average, uh, that was nine. Um, and kind of like uh, going through the um, one and two at the bottom of the table there, uh, you can see that the demographics for shooting victims in 2020, um, I'll just leave that up there and you guys can read that one. Um, just the caveat too that uh, White also includes Hispanic, and that's based on our uh, record management system and how they track things in there. Um, if there's no questions, we can go on to the next slide. And this is a uh, shot spotter activations, and this includes the same window of time by week starting in 2020, and it goes through the 18th of 2021. Uh, you'll notice that there are two significant um, bumps. Um, the, the top table is actually just an activation of ShotSpotter and the bottom table uh, graph um, indicates the number of rounds detected by the week. So what we're looking at the first major spike where you see 330 on the top and 1399 for rounds, that was the period of civil unrest. Um, and then the other spike is actually New Year's Eve um, in 20, uh, 2021. Um, and the two, the main takeaway from the tables are that um, pre-civil unrest, it was uh, lower than it kind of stayed static, but slowly is now decreasing as we look through, um, especially week 25, which is 616. After that, there's a steady decline, uh, albeit slow decline with the exception of New Year's Eve. Um, and all told, when you look at these combined the number of activations that ShotSpotter reported for this time period was 5,900 and the total rounds it detected was 24,330. So that just gives you an indication of um, what ShotSpotter uh, provides us in terms of data. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, and the last thing here we have is guns recovered. So last year we recovered 1,080 guns as evidence in 2020, and that's a 13.6% increase over last year in 2019 with 949 guns. And the table at the bottom just goes over the list of precincts and um, the number of guns and the percent of total that each precinct um, was responsible for, for responsible for for collecting. Um, 
the top three are the fourth precinct with 41 and a half percent, the third precinct with 19.9 percent, and then the first precinct with 14.2 percent. Should be noted that there were uh, 80 guns recovered outside of the city, and that um, total is 7.4 percent of the total. Uh, next slide. Uh, carjackings and robbery of businesses. Um, so I'll just go over the table and kind of work from top to bottom here. Um, in 2020, uh, there were 405 carjackings compared to 101 in 2019, which is a 301% increase um, to 2020 over 2019. Uh, robbery in business uh, was just a slight increase from 123 um, from uh, 103 in 2019, which is a 19% increase. Uh, it should be noted that we started tracking carjackings as a subset of robbery uh, and essentially what it is is a robbery with the loss of a vehicle or the vehicle that was stolen and we started tracking that when we started noticing an emerging trend in, in, in increasing carjackings in uh, 2020. Um, and then the next two bullet points kind of touch on um, robbery of business especially like the the spatial locations of where we're seeing those. In 2019, we saw a concentration of robbery of businesses along the Lake Street corridor, especially between Emerson Avenue and 11th Avenue South in the fifth and third precincts. Uh, in 2020, we saw a shift um, more west along Lake Street and then up the Hennepin Avenue corridor in the fifth precinct, and then also extending into other business corridors, especially in North Minneapolis and Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, and those two areas had uh, previously not seen those trends, especially in 2019. So those are things that we kind of noticed in terms of uh, robbery of business and also the uh, emergence of car, the carjacking uh, phenomena. So next slide. And I'll actually transition over to Austin for the uh, property crime uh, snapshot segment of the uh, presentation. All right. Um, so looking at larceny, I, me I mentioned earlier that larceny has a lot of subcategories within it. So it's really complicated to just look at the overall uh, category of larceny to decipher up versus down uh, year over year. Um, I just took a few of the uh, most, I guess, insightful subcategories uh, that we noticed significant changes in within this larceny category. Uh, one of them obviously is shoplifting uh, with the downturn in economic activity with the pandemic. Uh, we saw a lot of businesses close, uh, including those that stayed open had limited hours. Uh, this just reducing uh, opportunity um, and just overall activity uh, and operable hours for those stores. Um, that was a 45.4% decrease from 2019 to 2020, um, but theft from motor vehicle uh, so just traditional smash and grab type uh, thefts of valuables being left in plain view uh, in parking garages or what have you, those were down slightly 9.4%. Uh, but we, what we really saw um, a quite alarming increase in uh, was actually the theft of motor vehicle parts. And this is specifically talking about catalytic converters, uh, which is a part within the exhaust system uh, of vehicles. This is actually a trend that we picked up on, uh, not just here in Minneapolis, but nationwide uh, in 2020. And what it's tied to is uh, the increasing price uh, or market value price of the precious metals that are found inside of these catalytic converters. Um, so this has become uh, a very widespread uh, issue across multiple cities uh, in the country. So um, that's something that we are constantly tracking um, and keeping an eye on those market prices to try to predict uh, time periods where that criminal activity is more likely to be active. Next slide, please. Uh, and then auto theft. So uh, we've actually had um, a few years now of fairly consistent auto theft increases. Um, over the last two years, uh, it's been a 76% increase. Uh, a 36% increase just from 2019 to 2020. Um, and this, I should note as well, this does not include carjackings. Uh, so vehicles lost uh, during carjackings. These are just traditional auto thefts uh, as carjacking falls under the robbery UCR category. Um, I did wanna touch on 
Um, one of our, our programs that we have here is the bait vehicle uh, program and bait vehicle thefts, uh, while they were down 5.7% from 2019 to 2020, uh, they were actually just not out um, for as many days as they were the prior year. And this uh, was for a variety of reasons. It can even just significant snowfall, what have you, complications that prohibit us from putting them out. Uh, but we actually saw when we calculated in the days that they were out and active um, and available to be stolen out on the streets, uh, we actually saw a 20% increase or more than 20% increase uh, in their effectiveness based on uh, the number of cases uh, per day that they were out. Uh, these vehicles are placed st strategically throughout the city uh, using real-time data and analytics. Uh, to intercept repetitive criminal behavior. Um, and we actually started collaborating and, and giving real-time uh, data updates in 2019, in which the activations rose 105% from 2018 to 2019. Next slide, please. And that uh, wraps up our presentation uh, and we will leave it open for any questions. Thank you so much uh, for that information. Uh, we have Councilmember Fletcher in queue. I'm sorry, Chair Cunningham, I had my speakers off. I couldn't, I couldn't hear what you were saying. Was there any questions that you had or? Yes, we have Councilmember yeah, yeah. Fletcher in, in queue. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, I think it's really helpful to uh, to see this laid out this way. And um, I have a, a, a couple of questions, uh, things that I've been interested in thinking about. First, I found it really valuable to see the decline over time uh, on the shot spotter, which I think that graph shows simultaneously that we had uh, too much gun violence uh, last year, on, inarguably. And I think that trend is comforting to people that 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 there there's some some progress in the right direction, and so I think being able to see um, at least see that this isn't accelerating, right? Uh, at, at least be able to show that uh, um, the the data seems to be moving its way back towards um, something that we might expect in a condition that we would consider safe. Uh, is is helpful. So I guess I'm I'm curious as you think about the other uh, crimes that we talked about, as we talk about robberies, as we talk about some of the other things. Have you done a similar kind of uh, graphing? My sense generally was that uh, most things were slowing down a bit in the last couple of months, um, but that there are exceptions to that. So I guess I'm wondering if you can speak about where. Um, where we would see a similarly downward trend and where where there might be outliers to that or, or, or things that aren't conforming to that uh, trend of kind of a return to normal. Sure, I know that we talked most specifically or most frequently we talk about um, gun related crimes and gun violence. And so to your point, we've seen that dip a little bit, but it hasn't been as significant as it has been in um, previous years. And so we're just continuing to monitor that to see if that's going to continue the downward trend or not. And on the other crimes, um, and I'll let Scott and Austin jump in here at any time that they want to. I don't know of anything that we've got set right now from a reporting perspective to capture those other crimes. But um, on the ones as we see as outliers, like carjackings, for example, we're definitely continuing to track that and look to see if the types of um, strategies that we've been using to impact the occurrence of carjackings, if those are having any type of effect or what what are the outcomes of those and I guess as long as I'm on that that point this I'll just kind of mention some of the stuff that we're doing um, from an outcomes perspective um, you know there's really three areas that we look at from policing that we that we try to use different tactics and you know what we call it here in Minneapolis we do the focused enforcement details which is what I've mentioned before it's kind of that combination of plain clothes operations and patrol operations coming together to to focus in certain areas and around certain types of crimes that are occurring so 
you know, we've continued to do that. We've done that a couple of times since the last time we met in November. Uh, one of the other strategies that we continue to do and try to improve on is our case management and the metrics around that. So making sure that our case investigations are solid, that we're collaborating with our other law enforcement partners, and most importantly, our, the prosecuting agencies, um, whether that's the you know U.S. Attorney's Office or the county or our city attorney office. And then any of the specific initiatives that we do from time to time, Austin mentioned one of them is the bait vehicle program. So he's really been instrumental over the past year working with our um, <clears throat> patrol officers assigned to that, Officer DuPaul, to really use data to help drive where we put um, specific bait vehicles. So, you know, we continue to do that. And just as an example, I know there's been questions from a couple of different council members on well, what has happened on some of these enforcement details. So I'll, I can just recap that right now. And then if there's questions on that, and then of course, council member Fletcher, if you have some follow up on, on uh, your other question, but so since our last meeting, we've done two focused enforcement details. The, the most um, significant one was December 9th through the 11th. And that really focused around um, the carjacking trend. And it used a whole host of different um, law enforcement partners. And um, some of the just general outcomes that, that came of that, there was uh, 30 through, 32 people had been arrested and booked into jail. Out of those 32, there's three people that remain in custody. Um, and then nine additional people have been charged. Um, however, they've been released while their cases are being adjudicated. And then several during that day have also uh, received uh, some type of a citation. Uh, some of the types of crimes that were charged out in relation to that particular enforcement detail um, were aggravated robbery, narcotics, possession of firearms, and outstanding warrants for arrest that they had had from previous cases. Um, one of the things that we're going to try to do a better job of providing information on is tracking case outcomes. So where do they stand now? And so specifically related to carjackings, from July 1st through basically the end of the year, December 28th. Uh, as far as adults are concerned, there have been 17 individuals charged with carjacking or, or robbery related to carjacking. Um, there's been five that have been declined for a total of 22 adult cases. Now these change a little bit, um, you know, one that may have been declined before, maybe there's new evidence that's been, you know, uncovered or submitted where they can then charge that out. But that's kind of a snapshot of where things uh, are at from the adult perspective. On the juvenile side, which was really the trend um, of carjacking and the, the, the people that we saw that were really driving this uh, trend, there have been 38 um, juveniles charged since July 1st uh, in connection with carjackings. Three of those were deferred. Five have been declined for a total of 46. So, you know, I, I kind of give that as just a general overview um, of some of the things that we track from an outcomes perspective. So I guess I went on there a little bit long, so my apologies, but did that answer your questions and are, are there follow-up questions from any of the other council members or, or yourself? Uh, it, it did partially answer the question. I, I think the one thing that I would ask is, is if we, I would just emphasize that that trend data is helpful. Um, that sometimes, especially when we're seeing a year to date number, um, where there were some big spikes that really drove the, the number for the year, um, that can create some ambiguity about what narrative people should be thinking about in terms of what's happening in their own neighborhood. Um, you know, are, are, are things accelerating or, or, uh, declining? Uh, is there a trend, um, so and so, I, I, I'm just noting that I appreciated that format, and I appreciated the the perspective over time uh, from that graph. And so, if if in future presentations there's an opportunity to include that kind of uh, uh, timeline based perspective, I think that was really helpful. Um, the other thing that I would maybe just ask for your your insight on is is the um, you know, the thing that I think everybody's trying to figure out, and I, I'd be curious to hear what your perspective is um, on the question of how much of this is driven by sort of changing social dynamics during COVID. And, and I think specifically kind of what I mean is, uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the total part one, uh, you know, year to date, it was something like a 6% increase, which is both not good because we never want that number to go up, but also not 
uh, a sort of terrifying headline making number, right? But then within that that broader part one category, as you noted in this presentation, there are some categories that really uh, jump dramatically. There's obviously part of the story of, of the year was a significant uptick in gun violence. Uh, I think also part of the story of the year was some shifts where uh, if someone's going to commit a theft, uh, they're making different choices that might get categorized differently because the there's a different pattern of who's available to rob, right? There's a different pattern of uh, things that might have happened in the downtown entertainment district that might have been categorized as a larceny, which is a category that's way down, uh, you know, grabbing someone's wallet off the table while they're, uh, uh, you know, sitting out at a patio, which was something that was happening a lot last year. Um, and so we're seeing that category go down and people making either more dangerous choices or choices that get categorized differently um, as they're shifting to different neighborhoods and different patterns of, of how they're engaging in that activity. And so I guess I'm curious how much of that um, is feels like it's driven by social distancing and COVID and changes in business patterns and social patterns that might actually kind of return uh, as people return to more normal social patterns and how much of that feels like uh, kind of real changes in trends or changes in uh, types of crimes uh, that have a different sort of source. And I know that that's all kind of speculation, but I, I'd be curious to hear how you all are talking about it or thinking about it in relationship to that data. Yeah, I know all from my perspective and Scott and Austin obviously can, can weigh in here, but it's undeniable, I think, that the civil unrest played a part in a lot of the increase as far as the gun violence, the specific variables that are around that are probably up for debate and will long be you know, analyzed. And I think that overlaid with this pandemic that we're in um, has, has made the scenario very complicated to dissect. And, and you know, and in short order, come away with any real known reasons as to why why this is occurring. I do think that as we see a, a change into a more normalcy, um, you know, back to way things perhaps were from from a business perspective, that some of those types of crimes are going to to change. Right, They're, that's just going to be a natural ebb and flow. Um, but I'll you know, kind of nod to Scott and Austin here if you guys have anything that you want to add in. All right, yeah, I, all right, sorry about that. Um, I, I would like to chime in and you, you pose a great question and, and it's, um, I guess it's worth noting and, and Commander Case really kind of noted on it is we do to make the assumption or to guess the of kind of maybe the change in, in criminal behavior um, about things you talked about of what would traditionally be a larceny and is now graduated to, to be a robbery uh, just based on opportunities. We kind of need that baseline to compare and see how it changes back to normalcy. Um, but it is um, in like you you mentioned before is uh, to I as a crime analyst, I I don't like talking about just part one crime in general because I know that it, it differs so much um, based on the different crime uh, offenses. But um, we really actually um, we started tracking um, with the onset of COVID of, of we were trying to, to figure out how is this going to impact crime, uh, especially as it came to when we were forecasting staffing issues and really unknown about how the pandemic was going to affect people being isolated and what have you. And um, a lot of cities saw, for instance, increases in domestics uh, during the onset of COVID and, and when uh, people were beginning to work from home. And we were we were bracing for that impact um, and that, that sharp increase. And we just didn't see it during that time frame. And we were down 20%, I think, approximately um, in shooting victims at that time, um, but we really didn't see the transitional sharp increase in gun violence um, until uh, that first week in June, uh, in the onset of civil unrest, uh, including the shots fired and more specifically the carjackings really didn't take off until about August, I wanna say um, as well. So when we look at kind of the impact of COVID it is um, this is something that criminologists are going to study for years down the road, and, and um, there's going to be a lot of discussion about that. But basically, this is my long-winded way of just saying we're just going to have to we're going to have to see we're going to evaluate this um, in the coming months and years. But um, we're on it. <laughs> so. 
thanks for that answer. I know there's a lot of people interested in that conversation, so let's keep it going. Great, thank you. <clears throat> you know, um, I'll just add, you know, to to the criminological perspective is like, you know, how much of it, you know, the spike that we saw is like due to legal cynicism and, you know, folks, the questioning of legitimacy. And then, you know, I mean, it like, COVID, like all these layers and layers um, that we saw a change in behavior as a result. So um, I too am interested um, in, in being able to understand kind of the behavioral changes and and, and the triggers of those. Um, I, I'll just say uh, this, this was a really great presentation, really fantastic data. I appreciate the analysis. We definitely have the, have content uh, experts here on this. This was really great information. It was, the data was presented in very um, easy to understand ways, at least for me. Um, I'll, I'll see, uh, hear from the public to hear if that was easy, but I'll just say as a policymaker that it, it that it was easily digestible and um, helpful for me to be able to see it presented in the way that it was. Um, so thank you uh, to the team for that. Um, Commander, I'm curious um, if you are the right person to ask questions about response to the data that we're seeing. So we have like the data of like what's happening and then the strategic response to the data that's emerging. Um, are you the right person or should we be asking someone else to also come in to be able to dig into to the response portion of it? Sure, no, I think I'm the right person. I think there's, you know, there's different parts in the department. Obviously there's patrol, patrol operations, there's investigations. And I think I'm at least a good liaison um, for that conversation to, to take place. So if there are um, specific questions that you might have, let's say from patrol, for example, we can work that a couple different ways. Either I can reach out to the inspectors or talk to Deputy Chief Fours and, and present back on that. Um, or uh, I've got a pretty good, um, I think, uh, understanding of who would be the right person to bring in that can answer the questions if you know if I know ahead of time and I um, and as we go through this throughout the year um, if you you know whomever would want to present those questions ahead of time um, I can certainly make sure that the right people are at the table so that we can get the questions answered great thank you I really appreciate it because you know I, I just I really want us to dig into um, like the gun violence you know um, I had another 17 year old murdered in my ward. It's, you know, like it's it's just a pressing issue that we need to, we need to get to the bottom of. There's a couple strategies, you know, I brought forward a, a, a particular strategy, want to see that implemented. So I think it probably would make sense for us to have maybe a specific presentation on the implementation and the impact of that um, strategy. So so we'll, we'll save that particular uh, question maybe for um, another day, um, sure. another presentation, because, you know, what's, what's really important um and and we had had this I, maybe in the november presentation but it's like what's 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 important for the public and one of the reasons why we have this this platform you know this monthly presentation because folks are like what's going on and what is being done in response right like and so i just want to make sure that we have both sides of that um so that the public is able to know Oh, okay. So the police department is doing X, Y, and Z to address, like, so the car, the the bait cars, for example, like that's a that's a response, right? Like, we we know the car thefts are happening, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is the response that we've put into, like, the strategy that we're utilizing to be able to address that. Um, that that sort of um, information is really helpful. So, uh, if if necessary, let's talk offline so we can think uh, think together about how to be able to provide um, a full picture. Um, th but I just want to be clear: this data was awesome, really great work on that. Um, and so I really appreciate the thoroughness, the intentionality. Um, we definitely have some uh, some really great um, an analysts. So thank you uh, to everybody um, for your work. So let's make sure we get that full picture picture though for the public so we can be able to respond because um, folks are scared and so if we can reassure them that we're doing something we're working on it that would be that would be really good too so um so that's my that's that's my uh feedback um are, are there any questions or comments from my colleague colleagues 
All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you again, gentlemen. This was a really great presentation. The information um, and, and visualization of the data was very, very helpful. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you back here next month. So thank you. Okay, take care. All right. So um, seeing no further uh, discussion, I will direct the clerk to file that report. Next up, we have um, item number nine, which is receiving and filing a report related to the phase one of community engagement for transforming community safety. I believe that Director Sasha Cotton from the Office of Violence Prevention is here to give us the presentation. Yes, I am. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham Welcome. and Council Members. Thank you all for having me. And we are here to give an update on the Transforming Community Safety um, Phase 1 process. And I just um, feel compelled before I jump in to share a little bit about um, some feedback that we received. Uh, the Office of Violence Prevention is a part of a national network of offices of violence prevention across the country. And I just recently provided them with an update about where we are on this project. And it was really illuminating uh, to get the feedback from some of my colleagues across the country who are doing same and similar work. And I think it's just always really important to remind ourselves that all eyes really are on Minneapolis as it pertains to the idea of reimagining public safety. Um, and that, you know, this work is, um, it's so important, not just because it's, um, important as a system and as a city to be doing this, but really because we are focused on lives that have been lost and lives that have been traumatized. And so um, it, it was just grounding for me in the process and I thought that I would share that and I hope that the spirit of that is in this presentation. So um, eyes are on us and I hope that we uh, are ready and up for the challenge. I certainly feel like uh, the team that I've had the pleasure of working with thus far on this process has been, uh, and that includes many of the council members who have been so helpful as well as our mayor's office. So I will go into slide one, please. So just to refresh ourselves in where we are in the process and how this has been set up, the process is centered on developing a new model for community safety by focusing on three key areas that we call our pillars. The first pillar is focused on prevention and that's breaking cycles of violence before they begin. This work is led by the Office of Violence Prevention and includes intervention programs, funding to build capacity for community organizations, as well as um, developing shared goals around violence-free communities. Our alternatives work is uh, developing emergency service response that don't require a police response. That work is led by the Office of Performance and Innovation. And this work includes engaging community to analyze data for opportunities and to test new ideas for alternatives to police response. And our third pillar is reform. And this is focused on, on police reform and police policy changes. Uh, this work includes uh, some national experts that we've convened with, as well as really looking at ways to improve our police interactions with community. Next slide, please. This update is a preliminary report on just the first phase of our process. So I just wanna make sure that people are aware and grounded in the fact that this is a four phase uh, plan and this update will just focus on phase one. Phase one ran from around mid October through the end of December um, and really focused on gathering input on current models of community safety and opportunities for change, as well as high level vision and ideas for a new model. We are um, in phase two right now, where we are reviewing uh, and looking at additional input on the themes and goals that we gathered in phase one and doing a deeper dive into some more specific ideas that will inform our recommendations. Phase three, which will be coming uh, here in the spring, will really focus on gathering feedback on drafted recommendations. And then phase four will focus on refinement of those finalized recommendations. All of this will be informed by community engagement. And so um, that will be a pull through throughout the entire process. The finding in the first phase do not represent anything final. We wanna be really clear that this is just really an update for both the council and the public. They are valuable building blocks for further research, engagement, and the development of future ideas. The opportunity to provide input has not passed. There will continue to be additional opportunities to engage throughout the first half of 2021. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So we'll jump into methods uh, for the first phase. Next slide, please. 
So we have been using a mixed method approach. Um, engagement has included five different engagement opportunities. Um, and those are sur the survey that has been out on the web and continues to be up and available for people to fill out. Our stakeholder interviews, policymaker interviews, engagement sessions, and research. Using a mix of different methods is particularly helpful because it gives participants different ways to chime in and talk about their experiences. We're capturing different perspectives and when taken into, into account together, it allows for a more complete picture of the situation we're facing. It also helps us to identify consistent themes across the diversity of our city and the communities uh, within it. Next slide, please. So method one was our survey, is our survey. Um, it captures input on the current models of public safety. It captures opportunities for change, gathered ideas that can be incorporated into future models for further exploration and it should be noted that given the current pandemic conditions, we know that surveys sometimes feel cumbersome to people, but this was one entry point that we felt like we could put together quickly for people to begin to give input, um, recognizing that it should not have, you know, should not and is not the only way that we're gathering information. The development process for our survey was led by the health department, including our research and evaluation team. It over, and our, our research and evaluation team includes epidemiologists, who oversaw the creation of the survey. The research and evaluation team is trained in community input gathering and has experience with designing and analyzing results of surveys. The development process was guided by a cross departmental group that also included the Office of Performance and Innovation, Neighborhood and Community Relations and the City Coordinator's Office. Um, so many minds have been put into this process as well as into the entirety of phase one. Next slide, please. Continuing on the survey, the implementation process um, is that we launched the survey at the very end of October, so October 30th. Responses submitted through December 18th are considered in this particular update. Communication and outreach efforts really included a wide range of trying to push the information out there through social media, as well as on the city's radio programs, the web, newsletters, a large gamut of ways that we tried to push this out and get it out to the public quickly. This tool was available in English, Spanish, Hmong, Somali, and Oromo. Uh, and the analysis process, this data was generated by the survey platform was, excuse me, the data generated by the survey platform was used for demographic information and for quantitative oriented questions. Analysis of open-ended questions um, are being conducted by Navivo, which is a qualitative analysis software. I think this is particularly interesting because it will allow us to sort of have a Rolodex or a directory of key themes. Um, and as we begin to really look um, into the long-term strategy and are wanting to pull out key codes, key words, um, having the ability to have this index will be really, really useful so that we can drill down into the specific terms and ideas that people responded to in the survey. Next slide, please. The second method is our stakeholder interviews. So the purpose was to identify what safety looks like and to get recommendations uh, to assess communities awareness of transforming community safety efforts. As I think many people know, although this process started in October, we've been at the city level looking at transforming community safety for a long time in a variety of different ways. And so part of this was to gauge what people were aware of, to measure readiness in communities for transforming safety and to inform future community activities. Interviews were conducted uh, over about a month process starting in mid-November and going until the middle of December. We used a snowball sampling method which um, allowed community members to make suggestions on others who should be interviewed. And one hour semi-structured interviews with Likert were the um, way that the interviews were conducted. These were open-ended responses. And as you can see in the blue box, um, there was a number of different types of people that were interviewed. Next slide, please. We also conducted, I should say we, we have consultants who were interviewing policymakers and getting uh, information from our policy leads in the city. Um, this was done to capture and incorporate information from the significant amount of engagement that we know policymakers have been doing independently with residents since George Floyd was killed on May 25th, 2020. The process uh, used was that interviews were conducted with the mayor and city council members. Interviews were guided by the following questions. What have you been hearing from your constituents about their hopes for reimagining the city's public safety efforts? Have your constituents shared specific ideas around opportunities for change? And have your constituents shared any specific programs or strategies for how to improve services? Next slide, please. 
The fourth um, method was engagement sessions. Uh, the purpose here is to provide a baseline of contextual information on existing efforts, statutory requirements, and best practices. We conducted initial engagement to capture input on the current models of community safety, opportunities for change, and ideas to be included in a new model. And the process was led by our neighborhood and community relations. Um, specifically, they're culturally specific forward and identify these uh, resources, as well as our national experts that we've already been working with across the three pillars. So researchers and research assistants reviewed scientific literature, media, and public websites to identify public health and violence prevention alternatives. The team classified these programs into model types and captured model structures. Um, they have also considered evaluation of programs when they've been available. And the team has also captured illustrative information on jurisdictions that have announced intent to implement alternative models in the months since George Floyd was killed. Next slide, please. So we're gonna move into our survey results in the next segment of this presentation. I apologize, this is dense information, but we do wanna make sure that we're sharing it to the best of our ability here, both with the public and the council. Next slide, please. So survey response rate and demographic, there were 9,559 surveys that were completed at least with one valid response. Of those 57% of them, so 5,478 respondents completed at least most of the survey. 95% of those completing at least most of the survey reported being a Minneapolis resident. And unfortunately, BIPOC respondents were underrepresented and white respondents were overrepresented in the survey data. Given the responses and completion rates and the fact that certain communities are under or overrepresented, conclusions or decisions should not be based on this survey information alone. You can see uh, in the blue box off to the side, a uh, breakdown of the percentages of respondents based on ward. Um, there is definitely some variance, but we did get respondents from each of the wards. Next slide, please. So survey themes, um, we, we tried to break this out into some categories. So ideas around public health and prevention strategies, what we heard frequently mentioned were action and change are needed, safety and accountability, decreased crime and an increased investment in violence prevention, especially with a focus on mental health and anti-poverty strategies, equity and justice. Um, some of the underlying tensions are that some residents want more police and some residents want less police. And things that we should take into consideration are that crime prevention and investments in social programs should not be considered a zero sum or mutually exclusive topic. And I think we've heard that throughout the course of our gathering of information, but certainly we've heard that through the budgeting process as well. Next slide, please. Survey themes, so concerns around transforming community safety. We heard a great deal about carjackings, uh, city council members, city leaders, crime rates increasing. Of course, the term defund the police came up, equitable treatment, funding for alternative responses, lack of real transformation, polarization and diverse ad divisive attitudes, police unions, police force, police department, population specific experiences and needs, resistance to change and violent crime in general. So these are some of the themes that came out of concerns around transforming community safety. Next slide, please. Survey themes around ideas for public health prevention. Uh, we heard a lot about core uh, social services, things like affordable housing, mental health services, youth programs, gun violence prevention, domestic violence programs, and sex work programs. Um, who should be involved? Community members, social workers, mental health professionals, public health professionals, public schools, and other things that we should be taking into consideration at the city level um, that came up were training, resources, and um, the impacts of poverty. Next slide, please. Survey themes around ideas for police reform. Some of the concerns were the police union, the, the culture of the police department, the use of deadly force and excessive force and warrior training. Opportunities for change uh, included ways in which police are trained, de-escalation training and anti-bias training, community policing, union contracts, community engagement, recruitment and hiring, and the handling of misconduct. Other things that we should consider um, that as reported are accountability, racism, power, and the neighborhoods um, in Minneapolis. Next slide, please. Survey themes related to ideas for alternatives to policing are um, some of the concerns were police force, armed police, and police departments. 
who should be involved, our community members, social workers, mental health professionals, and other trained professionals. So you can see some um, parallel themes here with some of the pillars. Other considerations were restorative justice, safety, funding, training, and neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And some ideas uh, that came out of the survey for alternative response were most respondents identified at least one, excuse me, most respondents identified at least one type of call that they thought should be responded to by someone other than the Minneapolis Police Department. Some respondents expressed a desire for responders to be unarmed, whether police or not. And some respondents expressed a desire for alternative responses and police to respond together as a team, much like our um, existing co-responder model. Next slide. So survey themes and ideas for alternative responses. So who the alternative responders should be, we heard a lot about social workers, mental health workers, medical professionals, and drug counselors. Other considerations included training teams, so alternative responders and police, again, that co-responder concept, and then um, individuals who are unarmed as respondents. And you can see in the blue box, the types of calls, and they are ranked by the percentages of which we heard these responses. Um, you can see at the higher end, we heard a lot of people interested in alternative responses related to homelessness, mental health, drug overdose, and child abuse. And uh, on the lower end, we're hearing things like other forms of violence or assault. Police should respond to all calls and then shootings and shot fires, shots fired at the very bottom of the list um, for having an alternative response. Next slide, please. So results from stakeholder interviews, we'll jump right into the next slide, please. Stakeholder interviews um, identified some challenges um, and you can see them in the four bubbles, inequities and overcriminalization, uh, lack of trust and confidence, structural and systemic issues, and then delayed response and lack of follow-up. Next slide, please. Stakeholder interviews, um, these are some of the identified needs. So the short-term actions that are needed um, per the response were addressing immediate public safety concerns and crisis. People really felt um, a sense of urgency to make sure that this got addressed, that while we're focused on long-term change, we really are looking at the immediate concerns that people have around public safety, that these things vary by neighborhood that we really need to focus on showing the positive impacts and outcomes. I have long said that the city has a very hard time doing self-promotion on some of its successes, particularly on this issue. Restore trust in safety systems and meaningful engagement in community. Those are some of the short-term action needs. Long-term action needs were communicate a clear shared vision, address longstanding community social and safety issues, coordinate a multi-agency response. And what we heard specifically was thinking about um, the multiple layers of jurisdictions. So the city, the county, and the state all meeting on a regular basis to talk specifically about public safety, come up with shared vision and um, accountability measures and report that back um, to the public on a routine basis. Co-create and implement plans. Um, again, that's looking at sort of how do folks work together at the city, resident, business, and owner, um, community owner, whether that be home or business owner level, and then meaningful engagement with community. Next slide, please. So the stakeholder interviews also, um, we did a different delivery system here just to, to lay these things out in a slightly different way. The figure below shows the most consistent themes that stakeholders identified related to priority solutions for transforming community safety. So the larger the box, the more frequently the theme came up across the stakeholder interviews. So we heard quite a bit about public um, health and community-based prevention. We also heard a good bit about alternatives to policing, police reform, leadership collaboration, transparency and accountability, education and awareness campaigns, and then also defunding the police. Next slide, please. Stakeholder interviews related to public health and prevention strategies. Um, again, this is the same format. So the larger the box, the more that we heard about this. Um, the number one sort of theme was increase and sustainably fund a coordinated network of community-based organizations and programs that meet the local needs such as food, housing, jobs, um, and the like. Organize and coordinate organizations and resources, so sort of a similar but slightly different theme. Increase supports of families, especially with young children. Support community and residents' basic needs and then decrease obstacles for employment and housing. 
Uh, and these all you know, fit clearly into a public health approach to violence prevention. Next slide, please. As we talk about stakeholder interviews and the outcomes related to alternatives to policing strategies, develop co-responder models beyond the mental health work that we are already doing or have done in the city, give community power and resources to provide community safety, and promote and fund outreach and social service programs. Next slide, please. Stakeholder interviews related to police reform strategies. Um, again, same format, rebuild police and community relationships. There was a great deal of conversation about um, the engagement and relationship between uh, MPD and the community at large, address structural racism and systemic issues, increase transparency and data-driven decisions, address police officers' secondary trauma and health, and promote positive police interactions with the community. So you can kind of see some themes there that book end the front and the back end of this um, particular diagram. Next slide, please. Stakeholder interviews, recommendations for future engagement, keeping people informed about programs, policies, procedures, and priority changes and engagement activity, educating community on transforming community safety, um, and including the various community safety agencies. So who can do the work? What is even possible? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we're hoping to address that in the coming months. Alternatives to policing options, police reform options, move towards common definitions and visions, encourage community healing activities, co-create a vision for what transforming community safety looks like with community, continuing and enga continue engaging community beyond this first year. Um, that last bullet point I think uh, came up quite a bit in the themes that we, we heard from um, these stakeholder interviews. People felt very strongly that this process, although um, right now is time limited and we're hoping to have recommendations in early summer, that this is a much longer term process and that they really hope that the city will continue to engage, to continuing to engage with community um, beyond this first um, implementation strategy that um, will wrap this summer. Next slide, please. Continue with community stakeholder interviews with a priority on capturing voices not included in the first phase. Engage directly with communities in small neighborhood segments, um, for example, block by block. Strategically reaching out to non-English speaker populations, public safety professionals, and people impacted by violence and other impacted parties. Host police community sharing and listening sessions. Um, we did certainly hear quite a bit that people want to hear more from the police and the police department on this, this subject and how they, um, how, what their perspectives are. Seek input on safety issues impacting everyday living situations, such as grocery stores, parking lots, street corners, et cetera, and better engage certain demographic groups and communities to ensure that respondents accurately reflect the diversity of the city. And what came out of that bullet in particular is that uh, many of the respondents felt as though some of the groups that are more organized and active uh, and really engaged in the political process sometimes are overheard and that, that th those voices may not always represent the general population. So really important to be oversampling um, our average constituency and making sure that the voices of our communities are heard, not just those groups that are um, highly organized and um, focused on advocacy. Next slide, please. So results from our policymaker interviews, uh, we'll jump right into the next slide, please. So policy interviews, um, what we heard back from this question in particular, so what have you been hearing from your constituents about their hopes for reimagining the city's public safety efforts? Residents are expecting action, um, short-term action to address the immediate concerns that they have around public safety, and then a more long-term strategy to improve the city's public safety system. Changes to address immediate concerns should align, should align with long-term improvements. Attitudes vary by residents' existing um, interaction with police. So certainly in places where police initiated calls um, were more likely by individuals, people seem to have a better overall experience. Whereas when people felt as though the police have been called on them, they tended to have a more negative output. Um, many ideas seem to be coming from more vocal and organized groups and efforts. We talked a little bit about that even in the previous section. So that seems consistent both with our policymakers as well as with our stakeholder interviews. Residents are unclear on who is accountable for which parts of public safety and what is possible through city council action versus mayor action. And residents have not seen a clear vision as to where the city is heading. Next slide, please. 
Um, the next question for our policymaker interviews was have your constituents shared specific ideas around opportunities for change and have your constituents shared any specific programs or strategies for how they'd like to see those services improved. The two major categories were improved police community relations and engagement, including change to police culture and also a residence requirement. So having police live in Minneapolis, um, they believe that would be meaningful um, to engagement with community. The ability to remove bad officers from the force when needed um, and then building out non-police response systems, including mental health units and lower priority calls, getting a non-police response. Feedback primarily has come on an emergency response. So systems aspects of public safety, violence prevention efforts have come up less frequently, whereas people are really responding to what's happening to them in the moment. Next slide, please. So results from our engagement sessions. Uh, next slide, please. Our engagement sessions took place in November. Um, this is the first of many. So this reflects those that were done in November. We will continue to do engagement sessions throughout the duration of the project. Uh, there was an intentional emphasis on gathering input through discussions with communities that were underrepresented in the survey. So a particular focus on communities of color. Discussions were facilitated using the survey questions as a general guide, but facilitators encouraged discussions to proceed organically and sought to ensure that all participants were able to share. Um, that often meant that the a lot of time exceeded the 90 minutes that were um, the structured interview, but the dialogues continued until the group felt as though they had come to a close. You can see in the blue box some of the groups that were interviewed. This is not a conclusive list, but it does lay out some of the folks. Next slide, please. So the engagement sessions, um, effectiveness and quality of existing community service, um, safety services, excuse me. And this is some of the themes that came out of that. So ensuring responses are calm and prioritize de-escalation, that there's a need for fair, friendly, respectful, and timely service, that the current mentality is too militaristic, that racism, bias, and assumptions seem firmly entrenched in current responses, and that victims, those in need, should be taken seriously and should get the help that they need. Next slide, please. Uh, relationship building and I think this is um, general to the city but also has some specific things related to law enforcement. Desire for authentic relationships, partnerships and dialogues between police officers and community. Officers should know the communities that they serve. Officers, police leadership, others in community safety systems and city leaders should personally invest time connecting with their communities. Neighbor groups, block clubs should engage in community safety work, pay community for their ideas, input, and fund community equitably. Um, we talk at least in the OVP about um, the intellectual property and compensating people for that. And so this theme definitely came up. Work with community leaders, more open, regular and clear communication from the city and ensuring transparency and accountability. Not only clearly explaining what's going on, but also following up and reporting back to community on what is happening and what they can expect next. Next slide, please. As it pertained to alternatives to police response, we heard issues like mental health crisis, homelessness, behavior issues between family members, concerned citizens call, non-dangerous situations, complaints, domestic violence, sexual assault, and others could be addressed by alternative responders. Responders for these types of incidents could include um, just not police, co-responder models, interrupters, mental health practitioners, social workers, professionals trained to respond to a particular type of incident, community members, neighbors, community organizations, and community navigators. Communities should be a part of the response. Um, for example, community members responding, community aid and community teams. These were consistent themes. Cultural, culturally specific responders should be available for incidents that take place within an impacted or cultural community. And responders should be diverse. They should represent the local communities and should be racially reflective of the communities that they serve. Next slide, please. As it pertained to violence prevention strategies, the themes that we heard were that um, people would be looking for this to focus um, more on young people, um, focus on meeting community members' basic needs and providing resources such as financial resources, food, housing, employment, and addiction support. Violence prevention should be holistic and multifaceted. It should provide positive alternatives. We need to fund community organizations, address specific types of violence or violence disproportionately impacting specific communities 
empower, train, and support community members to be engaged in violence prevention and bringing back the Police Activities League. Next slide, please. The engagement sessions as they pertain to reform to police procedure. Currently, there is too much reliance on the force, currently too much reliance on lethal force. Current, um, excuse me, abuse of power is a problem. Racism, bias, and unfair treatment of communities of color are problems. Officers should be held more accountable. Officers should be responsible for their own liability insurance. Officers should receive training around mental health, de-escalation, working effectively with cultural communities, and alternative uses of force in other areas. Those responding to meet community needs should be diverse, should represent the local community, and should be raci racially reflective of the communities that they serve. And that last bullet was both about um, police response as well as other kinds of alternative responses. Next slide, please. Uh, recommendations for future engagement. Uh, these are some of the bullet points that we heard. Engage Latino business owners, do door knocking about this, engage North Minneapolis youth about this, get input from those suffering from what we are trying to stop. And many groups are doing police and safety reform conversations right now. Um, people felt that it was hard to keep track of who is who and who we already talked to. So we know that there are many community groups as well as the city and other entities that are having these conversations and people felt as though it was a little difficult to track all of what's going on. Um, although we believe with the best of intentions. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? Next slide, please. Our next steps for engagement uh, include community information meetings. We have our first meeting set up for January 26th at 6 p.m. And we also have a second one already set up and I have the date somewhere, uh, February 10th at 6 p.m. Uh, we're getting ready to launch meeting in a box, which will be a unique way for community to engage um, opportunity for community to convene their own discussions. So th this will be particularly useful because it won't necessarily need to be facilitated by city staff or consultants, but people can request the materials and feed it into a system so that we can get a more robust response and people can meet in the comforts of their own settings. Um, we're hoping that as we move into spring, people may be able to do some of these outside or in community using social distancing, hopefully as the pandemic uh, gets under better control. Learning labs featuring national experts. We're really excited to hopefully launch in February a series of um, learning labs that will focus on um, best practices and some of the research that has been done by the consultants working with us, as well as some of the programs that we already have. We heard clearly from um, all of the various ways that we gathered information that people really want a better understanding of what alternatives could look like and what violence prevention can look like and what reform can look like. And so we feel like the Learning Lab series will be a great way to start um, those conversations with national and potentially local experts. We also feel like it will be a great way to highlight some of the things that the city is already doing and get feedback from uh, the public on ways that we can improve. Youth engagement. So we've met with youth and we know that we need to meet them where they are to get their ideas. We're partnering with the Minneapolis Youth Congress who is facilitating engagement with their peers. And I should note that they will be doing a deep dive of their own at one of our future meetings because they want to present their own data um, that they gather from their peers on this subject. So we're really excited about that and we'll be looking forward to the March or April meeting to provide a deep dive from the Youth Congress. Next slide, please. And that concludes our presentation. I thank you. I also just wanna take a moment to thank all of the various departments that are involved in this work, as well as the consultants who are working with us. Um, this is a demanding project and a time sensitive one, as I mentioned before. And so it really has required reaching across the enterprise to get the work done. And I um, certainly stand before you as the person presenting this information, but could not do it without the help of so many others. And so just want to give credit to them. I I also want to take a minute to lift up Miss Amelia Brown, who was a city employee and a, a serious sister of many of us who are working on this project. She was a ray of light who we lost this weekend, unfortunately, and who we had really anticipated informing how we could infuse the arts into this process. And so we will miss her terribly personally and professionally and just really felt um, an impetus to name that and name her and how um, deeply sad we are to lose her. Um, like I said, both professionally and personally. So I will conclude with that. Uh, thank you, Sir Chair and Council for the opportunity.
Thank you, Director Cotton. Thank you for that raising up, Amelia. She uh, was quite a powerful soul and our city is a little less bright without her. So thank you for that. And thank you for this um, in-depth presentation um, with some really great um, information. I appreciate the mixed methods uh, approach so that we're, we're getting multiple layers of data. Um, I appreciate all of the various ways for folks to be able to get plugged into it. Um, this is a really great, as you said, building like this is great building blocks for us to be able to move forward with the next phase of work. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this uh, presentation. I just I just want to echo the praise uh, for this work. I think it's really exciting to see this kind of outcome. Uh, I think that it is um, uh, really important that I see things here that are both that I think for just about any user are going to be challenging. Uh, to their worldview and are going to be reflective of their worldview. And I think that that's exactly what we should be seeing from community engagement. Certainly we've we've heard uh, a variety of perspectives. And so to, to sort of uh, holistically capture uh, both the voices of defund and the voices of criticism of defund and also find a whole lot of common ground where there was broad uh, agreement on approaches that we could attempt and, and, and uh, start to really start to really see where the community is at. Uh, that's really the outcome we're hoping for from this. And I think there's real evidence that we're on the right track from this presentation. So uh, this is an extremely encouraging uh, report. And I really appreciate the deep community work, especially during COVID when it's so hard to connect to people and uh, really do engagement. And I think there's, there's evidence of, of some very good work in progress. And this makes me hopeful for uh, future phases and the work ahead. So thanks uh, for everything that you're doing. And uh, as you named to the whole uh, team that's working on it. Thank you, Vice Chair Fletcher. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? All right. Well, we will um, keep us informed as policymakers so that we can help. Um, boost signal the various components that we have the ability to get word out to our networks and our constituents so we can make sure that we have as broad of participation as possible. Um, I'm so excited um, to see um, uh, many of the things that, you know, I my values align with, my vision aligns with here to know that um, that at least I, as a policymaker, I'm on the right track. <laughs> well, that, excuse me, that report. And colleagues, we are on our last discussion item for today, which is receiving and filing an update on alternative to police response pilot programs as approved in the 2021 budget, including work to date and a framework for reporting future work. I know we've got the Office of Performance and Innovation team here to be able to give us this update. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham. Let me get my technology set up here. Um, uh, Chair Cunningham, Council Members, I'm Andrea Larson, Director of Strategic Management in the City Coordinator's Office. Um, I'm here today to provide a brief update and joined by members of the Office of Performance and Innovation team. Um, so we'll be providing an update on work that's happened around alternatives to police response already, and then the framework for how we plan to update you throughout the year. Next slide, please. Um, today, uh, so we'll go through um, the Transforming Public Safety overview, the framework, which um, Director Cotton shared, and I'll be using that as well to sort of orient us around what work we're doing, provide the update, and then turn it over to Gina Allen to um, talk about our future reporting structure. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so as a reminder, uh, this is the framework um, that we're uh, staff using for transforming public safety. And today, the update will be really focusing on the alternatives pillar. Um, and then I'll also be providing an update on a couple of research studies that are underway. And that falls in that policy analysis bucket, which informs all of the work. Next slide, please. 
The Office of Performance and Innovation has begun project planning for the various pilots and implementation projects. This includes stakeholder analysis, project plan creation, and um, stakeholder engagement. The area of, um, uh, of biggest progress is around the mobile mental health um, response pilot. So we are in the process of drafting an RFP for mental health workers to participate in um, this pilot. Um, since this expertise is not currently housed in the city, we've worked with community and county providers, um, as well as other jurisdictions who have provided similar services for the content of the RFP, and we're planning to release that RFP in February. Um, around communications and messaging, we've developed content that's included on the city's new public safety webpage, including a brief FAQ, and are working with OVP and NCR and other ways of communicating visually um, and through alternative channels. Um, like we did last year during our engagement, we will plan to translate these messages and use as many visuals as possible. Um, and then lastly, we will be hosting an internal kickoff with staff and our vendor, the CNA, for the Staffing and Efficiency and Problem Nature Code studies next week. Following that meeting, we can share more information about the work plan on those two studies for the year. I'll pause for a moment, and um, if there aren't questions, I can turn it over to Gina Allen to share our format for providing updates throughout the year. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Great. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues thus far? All right, not seeing any. Welcome, Great. Gina. Uh, thank you, Andrea and Committee Chair Cunningham and Council members. I'm Gina Allen, Program Manager in the Office of Performance and Innovation. And like Andrea said, I'll now be discussing the reporting structure that we will use to bring future updates to this committee um, on our alternatives to police police response work and the timeline um, of which we plan to present those updates. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, the reporting structure that we will use for each pilot. And as more work begins and is completed, we will update the respective project template to, re template to re reflect that, sorry. And while the details of each of these projects could likely take up an entire presentation on its own, we do feel that these categories will contain some of the most meaningful information for decision making. In each color block, you see some examples of the type of information that you can expect depending on the pilot. And there are additional slides included in the appendix of this presentation that show the project overview and goal of each of the pilots that OPI is leading. Next slide, please. Here you can see the projects that you can expect updates on going forward. And on the left-hand side, these are the pilot projects that the Office of Performance and Innovation will be taking a lead role in their development and launch. And the list on the right are projects that their respective operating departments will lead with the support of OPI in the form of technical assistance to complete an implementation plan, as well as troubleshooting issues that may come up along the way. As a note on that uh, right-hand side, R5 and MH4 are pilots where the funding was given to their operating department. So though they are pilots, our team will provide support rather than lead those initiatives. Next slide, please. This brings us, this brings us to our timeline and what you can expect in November. Between now and then, we will bring quarterly updates on the progression of the projects. Um, and the template you saw earlier will be continually filled in as we learn more over the coming months. Our team will evaluate the projects along the way um, so that we're able to adjust and make changes where needed and to prepare recommendations for the 2022 budget. Next slide, please. And that's the end of our presentation for today. It was pretty short. Um, thank you, Committee Chair Cunningham and Council members for having us. We're available for any questions you might have. Great, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, so, are there any questions um, or comments from my colleagues? Great. Well, I'm not seeing any. Thank you so much for uh, bringing this information immediately back. Um, I think a lot of folks um, were curious. Uh, folks, being the public, uh, were curious about what next steps are. They weren't sure if 
everything automatically changed on January 1st or not. So I think that getting this presentation in um, so quickly is is really good and um, so that we can be transparent about the process to the public. So thank you, thank you to the team uh, for this presentation and I will, um, and your level of transparency, and I will um, pause one more time to see if there's any questions or comments. All right, seeing none, I will direct the clerk to uh, file that report. And, um, I will just close us out today with saying those uh, that was those were four critical uh, presentations. So um, I recommend uh, for folks who um, maybe are just logging in or have not had the opportunity to spread this information. This is uh, many constituents have asked about this. So um, so I recommend uh, making this available and and spreading the information um, so that the public is engaged. So uh, with that. Uh, with no further business before the committee, thank you everybody for your presentation uh, and presentations and your hard work. Our city is better for it, and this meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody.